So are you considering purchasing a used boat? If so, you should be thinking about one thing, and what's that, Professor? You can make a lot of mistakes, a lot of costly mistakes. <laughs> costly mistakes. And in this video, we're gonna talk about mistakes that we've made and we see others make when purchasing a used boat. All right, friends, I am with the professor himself, Captain Ron Edwards. We have both bought used boats in our life, and for the context of this video, we're not talking about buying a used sport fishing boat, some of these behemoths, because that's a different class oh, of, yeah. of thoughts and mistakes, yeah. right? Yeah. Some of which we've made, professor, yeah. right? Some of which we made. So for the context of this video, we're really talking about that, you know, 16 to 35 foot, you know, production boat, you know, fiberglass boat probably, you know, fishing, family, fun, just like that, that's the type of class we're talking right, about, right? right? And so with that being said, let's 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 talk about some of those classic mistakes. You go first, Professor. What is one major mistake that you would say you need to be aware of? Well, whenever I've gone and looked at a boat in the past and I've, I've wanted, you know, been interested in buying it, first thing that pops in my head is can I turn around and sell this boat at any given point and make money or get my money back? Now, why why is that? Why do you think that is that actually matters? Well, it's different if you if you're loaded and you have a big checkbook. But I've never been, you know, my whole life I always worked for every dollar ahead, right. and it's always I, I never knew what tomorrow was going to bring. I try to prepare for the future, but man, you can have some terrible stuff go down in your life, and all of a sudden you've got to unload your assets. Well, if you're upside down in a boat, which is very easy to to do, you know, you're going to lose a lot of money. Yeah, you could be thinking to yourself. I'm gonna own this boat forever, and that might be your intention. Right. But you could easily turn around in a year or two and say, you know what? That's yeah. you know that's gonna change. People things change, things fast. change all the time. Give us an example of what would be something that would really hurt resale value in a boat. Make you say, if you were the potential buyer, you know what? That's going to hurt my ability to turn it around pretty quickly. Well, there's a bunch of different factors to consider in that, but the mechanics of it, you know, being me mechanically sound yeah. is, uh, that's one thing that can cost you a lot of money. Um, if it's got a lot of hours on it or something like that, it's not appealing to somebody that's going to buy it. And it has to be, you know, a boat that the majority of the population would be interested in, not a specialty boat. Yeah, I, you know, I think an example that I, like maybe like in this area where we are today, we're in the Northern Neck of Virginia. I think one example is if the boat has an inboard outboard engine. Right. You know, and those are the older class that you saw in a lot of, you know, production boats back in the day, those little 17 foot, you know, fiberglass boats. You don't see those inboard outboards nearly as much. Now it's mostly an outboard market. That's right. And so if someone sees that, they would know there's not a lot of mechanics for that type of engine at this point. And it's very hard to replace it. That's right. Whereas having an outboard, much, much easier yeah. in this context. And say like a, a center console boat versus like a, a wakeboarding boat. You know, not a lot of people specifically yeah. want a wakeboarding boat. But, you know, a center console boat could be, it has a, a versatility to it. It can yeah, be used for That a lot fishing. of people want. Yeah. Yeah, so. that's exactly right. Yeah. All right, so that was a good one. Number one, make sure that you're checking on that resell value. Number two mistake, and I made this one, Professor, is not doing a sea trial and a thorough walkthrough yeah. of the boat, which sounds so obvious, but sometimes it's not obvious. Let me give you an example of this. So, this Tiger Craft, I purchased it. It was almost brand new. The guy had had the boat built for himself because he thought a big sport fisher wouldn't be available for two years in, in, in production. Well, the, the manufacturer, the sport fisher said, hey, we can get you in, in line now, which meant he had to sell this. Right. And it only had like 20 hours when I got it. But I went all the way up to Connecticut and it was on a lift, it was winter time, and it just really wasn't very convenient at all to see trolley. But right. what that meant was when I first took it out, I was just completely blind in many ways. And I don't have the experience somebody like yourself has. And so, you know, I was in this process of just trying to understand things like trim tabs. I had never used trim tabs in right. my life, right? right? And I'm like, you know, it, why is it riding a little bit funny? I had to figure that out. I had 
never used twin outboards in my life. I was figuring that out. Now, granted, there's like part of this I would have had to figure out anyway, but still there was a lot more electronics, a lot more controls. There was components to like the uh, heat and AC that I didn't fully understand how to use. And so I'm sitting there and I spent my first week just trying to learn all these things. Whereas if I had a thorough sea trial and walkthrough and that person had taken the time to show me, but he didn't even really know because it was new to him. Right. You know, and so that's just something to, that's something to consider. And, you know, if you, if somebody was taking a boat on a sea trial, Professor, what would you say they should just be like looking for, thinking about? Well, number one is making sure all the systems operate like they should. Yeah. I mean, you might not even know if they're operating like they should, but they should be explained to you how they work, how you turn them on and off, how they should work. That's probably number one. And, um, you know, not setting aside the whole mechanics part, you yeah. know, the, the drive we'll talk about and all that. that. Yeah. But uh, the, the way the boat rides and the way it handles, you know, what I would say is pretty important too. I think that's a big deal because, you know, you have some boats that could be offshore, but are they really offshore boats? Right. You know, it's like, you know, how well do they ride? There's different types of offshore. There's like Fort Lauderdale offshore, three miles, four miles, five miles, right? right. Then there's like, North Carolina offshore, 30, 40, 50 miles. Virginia Beach offshore, 60, 70 miles. Right. So these are all like, like different things to think about. And it's like, you know, that's the type of thing in a perfect world. If you can see trial that boat, please do and really have an extensive walkthrough. And it's gonna save you probably some embarrassment, some maybe some regret, or you just messing something up that you that you shouldn't be messing up. All right, so number three mistake for you, Professor, would be what? Not having a mechanic come and go through the engines properly and do all the major tests on them. You know, it's easy to say, but I'm so excited. I got this opportunity to buy it. You know, I gotta take advantage of it now. But you're saying, don't fall for that. No. Do the legwork, no. why? Well, just because, I mean, if one of those Apple motors go down right there, it's a $30,000 bill. <laughs> you know is. what I mean? Yes, it is. So uh, <laughs> it can end up costing you a lot of money. And uh, just because they're newer and they have low hours, they might not have had the maintenance required, you know, to make them last and stuff like that. You don't know that they might have never not had the oil changed in them, you know, or water pump could be bad. I mean, it could be a, a number of different things. And uh, it's always a good idea to have a mechanic come through well, and to that, you know, if the, if the, let's say the outboard's got more than a thousand hours, well, that thousand hour mark, there's a lot of things that start to go at that point. That's like, right. you know, uh, you know, to your point, like a, you know, whatever, a water pump could easily, easily, or a fuel pump or what, whatever the thing is, yeah. you know, and I'm not super mechanical, but I know like you start seeing more and more issues right. at that, at that thousand hour mark in conjunction with that too, you can't forget the trailer to the boat. Yeah. This is an easy one to just disregard. You're so focused on the boat, and let's say a trailer came with it, that should also be inspected. Right, if you're gonna use that trailer, I mean, <laughs> all the time, it's pretty important. It's just as important as that motor, you know what I mean? Yeah, so. <laughs> very important. All right, so that was number three. Make sure that you check the maintenance, get that thing inspected. Don't make that mistake so you don't have any regrets. And any good boat owner should keep all a log of all the work that's been done, any maintenance records and stuff like that. So that's a plus if they have all that stuff and they can hand it to you in a folder. Well, why don't we do this? Why don't we make that number four, Professor? Which right. is just, let's call it documentation and history and making sure that you get those logs and that you pay attention to them because otherwise, like you said, did it get it, it's 100 hour oil change? Right. Did it, you know, it's like, there's all these things that's supposed to do. And if you got a good log, it means, if somebody kept a log, that means they were probably a pretty decent captain and took pretty decent care of their boat. That's if right. they actually kept a log yeah. in that documentation. And just legally, you wanna make sure that everything is kosher, just like you would with the house you want to do the same thing with yeah. a boat. Because some boats are registered in the state, some boats are documented with the Coast Guard. And if they're documented, they can actually have a lien against them and 
they still have the documentation in their hand. You know what I mean? So it's almost like if they're documented with the Coast Guard, you got to do like a title search on them, just like you do a piece of property. Yeah. And uh, that's pretty involved too. And it's not a speedy process to have that done. And that's pretty much something you have to get an outside company to do for you. Yeah. So, um, you know, but if it's registered, you know, it's just like a title that you sign over for a vehicle. There it is. There it is. All right. That was number four. Number five, friends. And this is a big one, Professor. And that is underestimating how much you're gonna have to spend <laughs> on the boat. Yeah. We've all heard the break out another thousand acronym, right, with a boat, but you even take a boat like this right here, right? I got this and uh, it was basically a brand new boat, but then I was like, hey, I'd like to get a sea keeper. So, all right, there's $30,000 for sea keeper one installed, or maybe it was 25 or whatever it was. And right. hey, I'd like to get a fleer because we were taking enough time early in the morning out of, you know, Oregon Inlet and we wanted to have that night vision. So like added a flare. It's like, so it's not just things that you might need to fix, but there's stuff that you might want to add. Right. And so you got to really think about how am I going to be using this boat and what is it really going to cost me to add those things? Those are just a couple things I added here. I have never purchased a boat that I didn't immediately put a T-top on or something else. And so those are the type of prices that you wanna get beforehand right. to figure out, okay, what am I really looking at here? Because if you budget it based, based on just, here's how much it costs and here's my monthly payment, you're not thinking about fuel. You're not thinking about the maintenance. You're not thinking about the upgrades that you're gonna to wanna to do and just the general fixes. Yep, the breakdowns. Because they are inevitable they are inevitable a hundred percent inevitable so that was number five and finally number six professor bring it home overestimating <laughs> your diy skills oh it's a good one because we've lived this one too yeah. <laughs> you sit back and uh you're like oh i can replace that lower unit or that water pump or something like that and all of a sudden you get to a bolt that's frozen or something like that throws a whole nother element in it. These people that work on these do it day in and day out. You know what I mean? It's not only the mechanic side of it, it's the waxing, the buffing, you know what I mean? Just all the things that it takes a certain amount of skill set to do or you could really screw something up. That's right. And so if you're thinking, I can do that, I can do that, be honest with yourself, right? because there's gonna be a bunch of other things that you wanna do as well. And plus you just don't wanna be doing work on it the whole time. You wanna be enjoying the boat. Right. And I would say, if you gotta buy it and then it's nothing but DIY. Yeah, that's no good. Then that's not, that's not the idea. The idea is that you start enjoying that boat because otherwise it could become such a pain for you. And of course, all this, we say so that you don't make the mistakes, you know, every year thousands and thousands of boats are purchased, used boats are purchased in the US. Some people have great experiences, some people have poor experiences. Make sure you don't rush it, you don't have to rush it, but there are times when you might have to. Yeah. And so like for that professor, what would you say? Like if somebody has to, for whatever reason, has to go a little bit fast because there's some type of deadline. I think you experienced that one time, right? I did, it was a boat for sale on, uh um vote at us what is or? the original uh where you could order stuff from <laughs> online uh angie's e list ebay ebay okay eBay. all right okay, ebay so there was a boat for sale on ebay that i found I he bought an ebay boat this I guy did. right here see like that's crazy but it was a legitimate ad yeah and it was 20, was this your yellow boat it was the yellow boat oh the my yellow goodness okay. it was a legitimate ad and it was like twenty five thousand dollars below what the resale value yeah, was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I hopped in my truck, went <laughs> three states, and went and looked at it. Went on a sea trial, and it, he, the guy had people call and call and wanted to give him a deposit over the phone. I was the first one there. Uh, I had to make a decision, yeah. you know what I mean? So, and I've been around boats all my life, but I'd never bought a boat like that. But we went on a sea trial. I realized that the boat was good mechanically from my knowledge. That's right. And was sound and it had been taken very well care of. You know, they had really taken good care of wax, good maintenance records, everything like that. So I made a decision, an educated decision, to go ahead and put a deposit down on that boat and buy it. You know, and the only reason I did it in such a short time frame was because every there was vultures everywhere and if i didn't i wasn't gonna get it yeah you didn't have any leverage no no leverage at all i had no leverage on the price yeah nothing but certain times there's instances like that where you have to make a decision but my advice to you is anybody that gets put in that situation is if you can get somebody to go with you to look at it that's knowledgeable about boats yeah. motor stuff like that 
you know, you, you, you two can put your heads together and make the best decision possible and then go from there. What a difference. What a difference. What a difference that will make if you got somebody with a little bit of wisdom, a little bit of experience. Yeah. And hopefully this helps you with your experience. I mean, that's the goal. That's why we have this channel. We want you to uh, not not make the mistakes that we have made, that others have made. And we, we just love this industry and we, we hope you love it as well. We also hope that you like and you subscribe to the channel, that you're a part of the community, that you come visit us and go offshore with this guy right here, the professor himself, Captain Ron Edwards, slip number 92, uh, Pirates Cove Marina, Manio, North Carolina. It's speechlesssportfishing.com. And if you have questions that you want us to answer, send them our way, put them in the comment section. We'd love to answer them. Until the next time, everyone, stay salty.